I did have a cool name, this called the code behind the curtain, you know, kind of a Wizard of Oz uh, vibe to it. But um, a lot of people ask, like, how, how are these advanced games made? And that's kind of the point of this. So we're going to focus on just making basic games for the, um, the Atari, um, how the games are generally um, put together. And then I'll focus on ARM development, which is um, what I've kind of uh, taken up with the later games that uh, make games like uh, Galagon and Wizard of War and stuff like that. So. so that said, the first question you want to ask is why would you even develop for a system that's uh, turning 45 next year? So the biggest one I think for all of us that even brings us here um, is nostalgia, right? I mean, for me, this is the first uh, video game system. I spoke fondly of it yesterday, if you recall, 10 years old, got it for Christmas. Um, you know, and that's the game that uh, kind of came back to in the 2000s. Um, I personally like it for its, its sim simplicity. Um, modern games are, you know, in my opinion, are a little bit too complicated, too much, too time consuming. Um, so the nostalgia of the Atari 2600 and the, and the fan base uh, inspires me to, to write games for it versus other ones. Um, even though writing for maybe the Coleco or something like that may, may all, also offer a similar challenge um, to me, I, I think the fan base for the Atari 2600 is probably the most rabid as far as that, that era is concerned. So, um, Also the challenge, um, this, as I just mentioned, this uh, system's turning 45 um, next year. Um, and it was developed um, with 4K of ROM and 120 bytes of RAM and a one megahertz CPU. So, um, and as I also mentioned yesterday, there's, uh, there's no frame buffer for drawing. So even just drawing a line on the screen is a challenge. So to take something like that and those limited resources and turn a game into it um, is quite a challenge. So as an engineer, you not only do you want to make games that are fun, but you also want to make things that keep, keep your mind young as well, too. So, um, and the community. Um, 2600 has a large following, Tar Age, um, where um, a lot of this uh, um, discussions are, are done, has been around for like 20 years. Um, it's a pretty rabid uh, growing community. I think there's like 10,000 members on Alice site right now. So there's a lot of people that are interested in all things Atari. Um, not only just um, the games they played, but also interested in playing new games. A lot of those new games may be ports of games they wish would have come out back then, redos of games that uh, maybe games uh, didn't come out as well as they hoped they would like, or even uh, um, um, custom games or original titles as well. So there's plenty of people to satisfy. Um, so you know if you're going to make a game for the Atari 2600, you're going to get people that are going to be interested in it. Um, and I mentioned at another gaming expo, like that's why I wouldn't program for the um, um, Odyssey or something like that. Because, you know, you make it, maybe 10 people will play it. You know, so at least for the Atari, you know, there'd be probably a thousand people that will play it. Maybe even a couple hundred will actually buy it. So it's a... You know, we all want to be recognized for the, the things we work on. So, it's, uh, so that's, um, that's why. So just dig right into the challenges. As I said, this is going to be more of a technical discussion. Not too technical. We won't be writing code, but I will have some homework for you guys. Um, kidding about that. But anyway, so the challenges, um, the Atari, the biggest one that I've always found is the, the RAM. There's only 120 bytes of RAM. That's not megabytes. It's not kilobytes. It's actually just bytes. Um, and that's not a lot um, because that's to represent everything in the game, whether it's objects, um, scores, and stuff like that. You want to have a score that's two bytes. Doesn't sound like a lot. It's also sharing the, the, uh, the stack with that 120 bytes as well. So if you're going to use any subroutines and stuff like that, you need to sh save a few bytes at the end so you can uh, call on the stack and return from where you've been at. Um, and even just drawing, since you don't have a, a frame buffer, you need to use a lot of that RAM just to set up pointers to uh, the graphics you're going to be drawing, sounds that you're playing, you know, game state and stuff like that. So 28 bytes goes really, really fast. So um, certainly during Atari's lifetime, they figured out how to add more RAM. They figured out how to add more ROM um, and things like that. We'll talk into that, but generally, um, you know, the... Um, um, the limitations of the Atari are, are basically this. Um, there is no video RAM, as I just mentioned, which means you can't, don't, you don't have like a 320 by 200 buffer that you can just write to the screen and it's going to show up. Everything is done line by line and everything is updated at, at real time. As I mentioned yesterday, it's called racing the beam. Um, so basically that's what you're doing here. So as the TV beam is moving across, you're updating registers, 
real time and whatever is in those registers gets shown on the screen. Um, so it's, a, it's very challenging to do that. Um, you also have only a one megahertz processor doing the work for you. I think the, uh, um, the graphics clock is three times faster. So it moves three times faster than the, the CPU one, but still not a lot of time. So you only have 76 cycles of, uh, um, um, scan line, um, work to do per line and to break that 76 down to load a value and to store it, just immediate loads takes five cycles. So you're already, you know, you can see that's, that's a big chunk of your line right there. If you know, and that's if you're just loading straight values, if you want to take it from a table. Now all of a sudden it's up to five cycles or eight, I mean, eight cycles. Um, so you can, uh, you're always balancing that. Um, and when we get into ARM programming, you'll see that that's, these are all still limitations, but they just uh, become less of a limitation based on um, the enhancements of the uh, ARM chip and stuff like that. They also only have 4K cartridge space. The uh, um, Atari can only access 4K at a time. Um, they did figure out um, um, how to expand that in the later years, even in the old Atari days, to 8K, 16K. Um, but you still, the Atari can still only see 4K at a time. So you can never have 8K running at the same time. What you do is call bank, bank switching, where you swap in 4K and then you can swap to another bank of 4K. But when you do that, the other 4K is no longer available. So um, still gives you the ability to have, like add more levels. Um, there's a lot of usually duplicate code between banks because if you want code that was in this bank, but you also want in that bank, you have to duplicate it because once you swap, this code can't be seen anymore. So um, a little complicated, but um, anyway, um, some of the um, issues are circumvented in the ARM development because we have 32K, but um, when I say 4K, that's accessible by the Atari because the Atari only has a 12-bit bus, whatever 4K is, is it to the 12th? I don't know what it is. Um, but the code that you write in the ARM in C is a 32-bit pointer. So that has does not have that limitation. You have whatever that is, 32K, 32-bit um, um, limitation, which is whatever that is, four gig. Um, not that we have that much space either, but so you don't have those limitations. So but we'll get into that. So, and then of course you have the one megahertz of CPU um, that does all your um, um, game logic and stuff like that. As I mentioned yesterday, since there is no frame buffer, the entire time the, uh, screen is being drawn, your CPU is drawing the screen. So you really can't do anything else. Um, we'll get into some um, um, diagrams that show how the lines are laid out. You have 262 lines, basically, maybe 200 are for display. And then the other 32 are used for vertical blank, which is the time before the um, screen gets drawn and the overscan, which is after it gets drawn. Those are the times where you actually use the one megahertz CPU to run your uh, your game logic and stuff like that. So the point being is that even though you not only do you only have a one megahertz CPU, you can only use it for 20% of the time really for game logic. The other time it's pegged um, drawing the screen. So, so are we still want to program for this thing yet? <laughs> <laughs> but it is it is challenging. It's quite a quite a thrill if you ever get something running on it. So. Um, so we'll focus on some of the specifics. So 120 bytes of RAM. Why did they only go with 120 bytes of RAM? Um, back then, a K of uh, memory cost $66. You can imagine the Atari, to keep it um, reasonably priced, they weren't going to spend $66 on the RAM part. Um, there's no way, because it was like, whatever, $200 back then, or $250. So, um, so um, 120 bytes is about an eighth of that. So. You know, they, they still use a big chunk of their budget just for the, the 120 bytes, which was $8 um, for the cost of uh, the system. Um, and you can see the hardware budget for Stella, which was the nickname, um, the code name for Atari that was being developed back in 76 and 77. Um, the budget was $25, $35. So they used, you know, almost a third of their budget just on that 120 bytes of RAM. So I guess in retrospect, we should be glad we got that much. <laughs> um, no video RAM. Um, so this means you don't have that great 320 by 200 or 128. The resolution on the Atari actually is 128 by, it's usually 192, but um, some people push the limit and extend it to like 200 in the Y direction. Um, I actually go to 208 sometimes. Um, 
you're really pushing your luck there because you may roll the screen, but people have found that that's probably the maximum you can really take. The problem is that you're stealing from Peter, giving to Paul, whatever that uh, parable is, because the more lines you use for the, the screen, the less lines you have for vertical blank and overscan. So now you've taken you know, four or five more percent of your processing power away for moving objects, prepping the screen, doing collision detections, reading joysticks, stuff like that. So it's a, uh, but some of the games like Galaga and stuff like that, um, you know, require a taller screen to be somewhat playable. So, so, and again, with the ARM processor, you get um, more time in those uh, vertical plank and the, uh, and the um, overscan to do it anyway. So you couldn't really do it without it. So anyway, so if you don't have video RAM, how do you actually draw anything on the Atari? So basically we have what's called the sprites. So we have two player sprites. These are two eight bit sprites, um, which you have an eight bit pattern that you set with a byte and that's what gets drawn. So um, if you have that set uh, at a particular, or uh, have that register set, that'll be drawn on your screen wherever the exposition of the um, um, sprite is for the entire screen. So what you need to do is you need to change that every line if you want to have that graphic change per line or turn it on or off and stuff like that. And that's where the magic of the Atari comes. That's where it's like, okay, well, how tough can it be? You just put it into the same. Well, no, and you have to put all the logic in the kernels to have new patterns loaded into that real time on the line before this beam gets to where this, uh, the uh, sprite is. And then you have to turn it on and off based on where you want it um, vertically on the screen. So. So you have two of those sprites, and those can each be a different color um, per line. Um, then you also have two missile sprites. Two missile sprites are basically just a one-bit sprite, so it's either on or off, but you can decide how wide it's going to be, one, two, four, or eight pixels wide. Um, then you also have a ball sprite. The ball sprite is similar to the missile sprite where it's one bit, um, but it's colored the same color as the, um, the play field. And then the low-resolution play field is a 40-byte, um, so even though the Atari, um, X resolution or horizontal resolution is 120 bytes, it's only uh, 40 pixels, um, play, um, play field pixels wide. So they're very, very chunky. Um, I should also mention the missile sprites share the color of the, of the player sprites. So, so those are the five. Well, yeah, five sprites and the low res resolution play field out. No matter what ARM processor you throw at it, the, eventually you need to squeeze all your data, or whatever you're going to do, into these five registers at the proper time as the screen is being drawn in real time to render your screens. Does that make any sense? Any questions so far? Or is that a. It'll make a little bit more sense. So basically, we have the two player sprites, as I mentioned, eight, eight by one, and there's a sample pattern which would show, you know, the. Um, specific bit set um, and then you have if you don't change the pattern it just repeat so if I set that um, that register to that value and set the color to blue I would just have that pattern blue all the way down the screen not much of a game but um, the magic obviously comes from changing every line then changing the color every line potentially changing the exposition every single line maybe the number of copies every line and then um, and that's how you get, make it seem like there's more than two sprites on the screen. You're using the same player sprite. It's just being repositioned as you move down the screen vertically. And then since you're turning it on on different lines, it appears, I mean, uh, horizontally, and then it appears to be uh, changed um, vertically as well. But it's really just one register just being reused and changed dynamically. Um, so here's the Space Invaders guy. So you can see what's happened here is that so every line basically before it gets drawn, we load in a new pattern, store it into that register. And by the time these, um, the um, television beam gets to where that was supposed to be drawn, it reads from the, your player register and says, okay, we have one bit here in blue. And then we come back here, then we have two bits, then two, and then there's the eyes and blah, blah, blah. And then that's how it, how it knows. So it's basically loading it from a table or wherever you've stored your data um, and then um, um, rendering it on the screen. So, so a lot of the work is done prior to that where you set, where do I start drawing? Where do I end drawing? And here's the, um, you know, using in indexing, I can set a, uh, um, a pointer to where that data 
lives. So that's how you can do animation. So every frame I say, okay, I'm gonna to point to this guy first and then maybe uh, um, the next frame, I'm gonna to point to the same um, picture but with his ears flipped the other way. So that's how you animate, stuff like that. So, um, so um, player features is that you can actually extend, um, again, through uh, um, registers, you can say, okay, I wanna draw a player sprite but I want it to be twice as wide as so it'll appear to be it's still only eight bits of resolution, but it's stretched over two uh, graphic cycles per pixel. So it appears to be 16 um, bits wide. Um, then you can also do a four times where it's gonna actually be 32 pixels wide. So things like this are, you've probably seen like maybe an air sea battle if you've ever played bomber versus uh, um, the three uh, um, fighter jets. The bomber is always huge and whoever had it lost the game because you can't dodge bullets because it's so huge. That, that's a four player sprite. So it's basically just eight pixels and they just set the four player. And now all of a sudden you have this huge bomber. Um, you also have, um, you can also duplicate um, things. So if, as you've seen in uh, Space Invaders, how did they get 36 um, enemies on the screen with no flicker? Well, basically what they did is they used player one and player two triplicated, spaced out 16 pixels apart. And then they, um, um, overlaid them, alternated them. So basically what you end up getting is you get six across, you know, the, uh, um, you know, and catch it, they have to be the same image in this particular instance. So there are ways as you'll see with uh, um, some more complicated uh, kernels that you can actually change the sprites mid screen. So even though um, in this example, we'd have uh, the same, um, the same um, invader being drawn here. They've done things where, you know, you change the image of the second copy before it gets to there to another image. And that's how they put like text in the screen. So they've just changed the image before it gets drawn um, using a, a, a triple copy of the sprite. So, but since there, it's all done in real time, as long as you change the register before the second copy gets drawn, it just pulls from the register. So as long as you're updating the second copy before it gets to there, it's going to show the new value and same thing for the third. So by alternating that, you can actually show six different sprite images consecutively across to make it look like a 140 pixel sprite. That's a little probably uh, um, advanced for what we're talking about, but just trying to get you guys to think of how the Atari works. So that way it makes more sense when you say, well, okay, well, you only have one sprite. Why does this thing? You said it's only eight pixels wide. Why do I see a image that's obviously one pixel resolution, but it's 40 pixels wide and completely different? Well, that's how they do it. So through some trickery, you can uh, make these changes right at the exact specific time and make it uh, appear that these triple copy is actually three different sprites. Um, so there's uh, the duplicates and there's the triplicates I was just talking about. So. And then you can also reflect your sprites too. This is uh, helpful for saving ROM. So a lot of like my uh, games like Wizard of War or Mappy, stuff like that, you have the mouse running one way. Instead of having to draw all the same animation and flipped around, you just have a reflection bit, you just set it and it draws the same exact image just reflected. So and all it's doing internally is just uh, when it goes to copy the uh, data from the player register, it just does it reverse. So it's so. Uh, Kind of some neat tricks that they thought of um, when they designed. I mean, think of this was designed in 77, so they use this in combat. So in combat, when you know, rotating your uh, um, tank, they don't, they didn't draw a time. They only, the games back then were only 2K. Even though they have 4K um, they could have worked with, they only used 2K of ROM because, to save money because it was expensive back then. So they wanted the first games to be cheaper so they could actually make some money off them. So air sea battle and things like that, those are all 2K ROMs. Um, so to get all those, even they still had all those game variations and they managed to do it just by little simple things like this. Hey, you know, let's use the triple copy to have bomber versus three air, airline th uh, air, air um, um, fighters. And, uh, you know, let's save ROM by using the reflection bit for the, uh, the tank and stuff like that. So, so pretty neat. So then the two missiles in the ball, again, this is the same thing where, um, it's just one bit that you set either on or off and depending whether it's uh one two four x so you, you can change the size 
What's interesting is that you can actually use this to uh, um, create sprites as well. Because what people are always trying to do is reduce the flicker in an Atari game. You want to have more than two sprites in a in a line, um, independent sprites. You know, it's going to flicker if you have more than two because you only have two sprites. Um, you can use the missile and the ball to create um, complex or sem semi complex uh, sprites that look like they're um, um, player sprites by changing the size and the position each line. So what you can do is you can actually shift the exposition of the uh, these images per line, shift it over one or two, and then change the size before you draw. So you can see what here, this bell, the uh, missile is two pixels wide, and then it's four, four, eight, and then one. You see how that works right there. And you can see how the exposition, which is the far left, um, gets shifted over one, and then it gets shifted over two pixels, and then back two pixels to the right to simulate uh, um, a sprite. So that's a, this is actually done in a game called Hunchy. Um, I do actually use the missile and the ball for some of my games. Ro Robot War is one of them where I draw the missiles, the diagonal missiles, um, using the uh, on the ball and some of the tank bombs and stuff like that. So, and they're simple sprites, but you can't tell that they're the missile. So it's, it, it gives the illusion of more sprites being drawn with, uh, without adding any more flicker. So and then the play field, the play field is um, a 20 by one image, um, but I said it was 40. So what happened there? Well, the play field is only 20. Um, so it's basically uh, two and a half bytes um, wide. And what you can do is you can either repeat it or you can reflect it. Um, and again, but what you can do, as I've mentioned, hopefully you guys are getting the uh, gist of it, is that you can change registers midline. And that's how people get asymmetrical um, backgrounds um, where they write, you know, the image for the left side of the play field, if that's 20 by image as it's being drawn. And before it gets to the second half, they change the images, the registers again. So it gives the appearance of a 40 um, byte, um, a, a 40 uh, play field pixel image being changed. Um, so there's pretty uh, intense timing to do that. But we do that for things like uh, Turbo. If you ever see the Turbo uh, demo out there, it's a full screen asymmetrical um, background where you know it's basically writing all 40 bits every single line and changing them at the exact time. So it appears that it's a uh, um, a unique 40 um, by image. So so there's it's reflected as well. So a lot of um, games will just use a reflected play field. Um, like Adventure, for example, the uh, the um, castles, they just draw on one side and then just reflects on the other. So it's good. Um, problem with um, if you're going to use an asymmetrical play field and change the other side, you know, that's each one. Of the, every time I say update a register, that's at a minimum five cycles. Um, could be seven if you're loading from a table. Could be um, eight if you're, you know, using uh, dynamic pointers and stuff like that. Um, so if you just do the math, you know, if I have to update six of these registers at five cycles a piece, that's 30 out of 76 cycles I've used just for the play field. I haven't drawn my players yet. I haven't set any colors yet or anything like that. So, and that's if you're using the bus. I mean, not the bus, the, the arm. You know, if you're doing anything um, programmatic, like through assembly, you're going to need to do something more than an immediate load of a register. It's going to have to be some kind of index. So it's not going to be five cycles. It's going to be seven at a minimum. So now you're 42 cycles into it and there's only 76 and you still have to do loop management and stuff like that. So things to think about when you say, oh, why didn't they just use the full play field? So things like um, if you see my games, even like Scramble and Super Cobra and Mappy, I only use four. I use a reflected play field, but I only use um, 16 of the 20 um, um bits per side so i use 32 instead of 40 and the reason why i do that is that saves you two um, register rights because i don't so like i said it's 20 um, bits so that's two and a half bytes um, that um, you have to write to um, but if you can avoid writing to the far left and far right registers that saves you two um, um, register rights which could be as much as you know well in the arm it's 10 cycles which is still 
a fairly good chunk of your 76. And then if you're doing something else um, that doesn't involve the arm, that could be up to 16 cycles you've saved. And all you're doing is you're just making it smaller, a little bit smaller. So um, hopefully that, does that make sense to everyone what I'm kind of saying here? So here's just a quick uh, image uh, that shows the asymmetrical timing. I just do this in here. It's kind of probably a little too technical for what we're talking about, but basically those three registers I'm talking about are called PF0, 1, and 2. So PF0 are basically the four left bits. PF1 are the next eight bits, and PF2 is the eight bits in the middle. Um, so that's the 20 bits I'm talking about when we say updating the play field. So based, these are obviously all drawn. So you, your first four bits would be your first 16, since each one is four pixels wide. Um, that's your first 16 pixels of your X resolution would be your four um, PF zeros. So basically you have to make your updates to PF zero before the line even starts getting drawn. Like um, you have a few cycles before the beam starts actually drawing something on the screen. It's called the, uh, the uh, um, um, what is it called? The, the W sync it's called. It's a, uh, it's a part of the line where it's uh, wrapping around and s starting to draw the next line. So you have like 22 cycles there where you can do all your setup before things start getting drawn on the screen. So basically you're drawing there, then you have to draw to PF1 before cycle 25 or 28, whatever it is. And then you have to start drawing to PF2 before cycle 36. So this is, a, I've used this a million times. Um, so, you know, off the top of your head, like, when you're drawing your kernels or writing your kernels, like, okay, I can squeak this in here, but if, you know, if I don't update, you know, this register by this particular cycle, you're not going to see the image is going to be corrupted. You know, you're not going to see the proper bits being set or they'll be overwritten or something like that. So, and then it gets a little more complicated, even more as you try to do an asymmetrical one where you're writing to the play field after that. Um, so if you're updating PF0, then you have to update PF0 again before the, middle of the line you know you have to make sure you have to update it after pf2 but before pf0 so it gets uh it's a little complicated so anyway so that's uh that's kind of the nuances of play field uh but i've kind of delved into this a lot with a lot of my games like uh robot war all the uh grunts and the electrodes are drawn with the uh um play field so but you can imagine those look like they're just independent things running around so um that's asymmetrical play field as you can as, as you can get you know it's like and it has to be dead on because if you draw it wrong the whole thing is not going to show up it's going to be corrupted so um and then things like scramble and mappy and uh, super cobra where the entire play field and, and turbo where the whole play field is scrolling so if you don't if you're not your timing's not set properly you're going to see shears in the uh in the uh, image and stuff like that so so that's what I was talking about before, the 4K cartridge, the limitation, the challenge. The original games were 2K, but um, some of the uh, later releases, Fatal Run specifically was one of the last releases by Atari in 1990, was 32K. Um, so they had figured out how to, uh, as the price of ROM went down, they figured out bank switching where they could say, in games like that, like I said, they can only use 4K at a time, um, but even be able to duplicate code over um you know over that 32k still gives the illusion of more levels and more graphics and things like that you just use i did that in ladybug a lot you know you try to uh have it so you can um share data in one bank over the course of different uh um banks so you're not wasting all your rom duplicating stuff but sometimes it's uh something that you can't avoid so um yeah so and you can imagine when they designed the Atari, um, they weren't thinking, okay, we're gonna put this thing together in 77 and there'll be some idiot developing for it in 2021, so let's make sure it's flexible. Um, you know, they thought it's gonna be done by 79, you know, the new system's gonna come in. So this thing only needs to be 4K games at the most, um, and then we can move on. But as you can see, history has a way of uh, deciding its own fate, right? So. Um, um, the Atari was active up till 1990 and they squeezed literally every drop they could out of that thing. And now, now the homebrew developers and, you know, the people that uh, grew up with this thing have really pushed it to its limits. So now it's, 
doing more than certainly they ever thought it could ever be able to do. So, and I've, I've had conversations with like Joe Decor. Um, he's one of the original engineers and you get to see some of these things and they're, they're just blown away by what people have been able to still squeeze out of the system. So that's really a, a testament to them and their flexible design. You know, even though this was something that wasn't as powerful as a ColecoVision or an Intellivision, something like that, just the way it was designed and the flexibility um, really allows it to still continue to evolve as opposed to just being in a sandbox and saying, well, yeah, this much RAM, this is much CPU, and that's all you can do with it. You know, it's, that's it. This is more like, well, you know, so sometimes the curse was its, its greatest blessing, and that, that's the, uh, the um, racing the beam that we mentioned, so. So, and, you know, um, one decision they had made, I think it saved like a penny on the cost, was that they decided not to put a read-write line into the cartridge port. If they would have done that, they would have been able to expand the ROM um, size very easily. Um, but they didn't. So that's why they have to do all this unique bank switching um, scheme that they came up with where they swap in 4K and stuff like that. So, and Joe did actually say that that's one thing that they do regret, that they do wish. If they would have done that, it would have made things so much easier for expanding games and making them more powerful as a as a system. Uh, but you know, engineers persevered and they figured out ways around it anyway. But those are one of the things that, that I think they wish that uh, would have been done. Okay, so here's a twenty six percent of one megahertz. Is what I was talking about. So, so out of the two hundred sixty two lines, it's uh, how much is on an NTSC a screen that you have. Um, 200 or so are for your screen. So that leaves you about 62 lines of overscan and vertical blank where you can actually run all your uh, um, logic. So that's about 26%. Again, this goes down as you steal those lines and make your screen taller. Um, so this could be down to 20% if, uh, if you go down too low. So um, as I've mentioned a few times, the CPU updates the TIA scan line by scan line in real time. And that part of the uh, um, game is called the kernel. Um, and basically what it is, it's just the loop that runs for 200 lines and draws your screen. And its job is to take data off of wherever it's gonna go, stuff it into the TIA registers at the right time so your screen gets rendered. That's all its job is. And no matter what you do, yes. I was just curious, is, is that code that runs the kernel, is that code that is a kernel, is it reusable between game, 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 or is it consistent across blocks of games, or does the kernel have to be rewritten every single time you develop another game? Um, it all depends. If the game is similar, um, like the Atari Basic, I'll talk about that um, later, uh, but that's something that someone put together. It's basically kind of like a basic wrapper. It kind of allows you to write code, Atari code in basic um, you know, like draw screen. I've never actually used it, so, um, but what that does, it use canned kernels. And so they'll have a kernel that says, here's a kernel that is, gives you two players, um, double resolution, um, one's multicolored, one single color, and the ball, you know? And here's another kernel that's, you know, a symmetrical play field with a single resolution player and, um, two missiles or something like that, you know? Oh, okay, so, so it can be, I guess it's somewhat situationally based, it's just based upon the design of the game as well. Yes. Yeah, okay. Yeah, personally for me, I write a new kernel every single time. Okay. And there's multiple kernels too. So as you can see, uh, what will happen is that you don't have to have just one kernel that draws every um, line of that 200, you know? So you have the flexibility to say, okay, well, I need, you know, um, if you look at the, uh, um, well, um, we'll just get to here. So there's a picture of my ladybug that I, I wrote. So the top of that screen that shows the special and the extra, that's what I was just, that's what I was mentioning before about a 48 pixel sprite that shows, um, you know, that's obviously more than eight bits of resolution and it's, um, it's more than 16. So we're using more than two players there. So basically that's two, I think it's triplicating both players and then updating the value of each register at specific times to give the illusion of a 48 pixel sprite with no uh, flicker. So those are specific kernels when I say it's a kernel. So it's a one line of, you know, one group of code that renders 76 cycles of, uh, um, but it's repeated. Like 
six, whatever, that's like five lines, maybe 10 lines high. So it runs that specific kernel, 10 lines, and it's pulling information. So as you collect letters, you know, the S and the P and the C or the X, whatever, will become highlighted and have a different graphic. So basically in RAM, I have pointers set up to what values to display, or I calculate it on the fly as it's getting to that point to say, okay, when you go to show these two sets of graphics, you know, since, you know, I have a probably a bit pattern that shows what letters have been collected for special and which ones have been collected for extra, it uses those to determine um, what values to set your pointers to when you're displaying those graphics. So, and then you see the line after that is the top of the play field. Um, so that's just the play field, but it's, um, it's a um, reflected play field um, because that's our timer that will expand and contract as the, as the game goes on. So that's also reading data from a different set. And there's no players on that line, so I can use a specific um, kernel that um, only needs to read play field data. Then we get into the game itself. So now the game, I have to show an asymmetrical, um, that first line with the dots, I, I can show up to two multicolored, um, well, actually they're single color, sorry. Single color sprites, single resolution though. Resolution meaning the value changes every single line. Um, sometimes what people will do, and you'll notice is, um, in some games, that they'll use sprites that use the same value um, every um, two lines. So they appear to be thicker. But the good news is that um, it allows you to have more um, complicated kernels because you don't have to update the uh, sprites every single line. You have to do it every other line. And if you alternate it, so now you're just alternating player one on line one and player two on line two and alternating down there. So it allows you to have a more flexible uh, um, um, kernel. But we also have the dots that are being drawn by the uh, play field. And that has to be asymmetrical because you can eat dots on one side and not the other, right? So, and that's only done on one line though, every, I think 17 lines. So that is just a specific kernel that I have that draws the dots and also the line of the uh, players that it needs on those. Um, and then there's other kernel, mini kernels in there that are drawing the maze and, and the other um, parts that don't have the, the uh, missiles. So, I mean, the, uh, the, uh, um, the dashes, so. And then on the bottom, you can see we have another specific kernel that shows a triplicate of a player for your reserves on one side, and then it's showing the uh, um, vegetable that you're on on the last. So that's another specific kernel that I'm using. Um, that one's obviously fairly simple to do, it's just triple. And then the last one is the score kernel, which is a flexible 48 pixel sprite um, routine. And things like the 48 pixel sprite are very, very common. People have written them and those are freely available. So it's not like, a, so they figured out how to do it. You just gotta copy the code and you know make sure that you're updating things properly. So, um, so if we go here, here's kind of like a, um, a visual of how the screen itself fits in with what's going on in the Atari. So you basically you have your vertical sync and that gets stops your screen from rolling. So basically for three lines, um, you have to sync your signal in your TV to make sure that it's, your screen's not rolling. So that's, and there's macros that do that. So that's automatic. So you have, you call something called vertical sync. And basically it takes three out of your 262 lines away from you. So, you, so you're already down to 259. You haven't done anything except sync your, your, your computer. And then you have 37 lines of vertical blank. And I say 37 lines, but that can be flexible based on, you don't want it to be too small, um, but basically, uh, this is going with the assumption that you're going to go with a standard 192 um, screen height for your game and then 30 um, lines of overscan. So if you add all those up, it turns into 262. So as long as you keep that number 262 and you add maybe, like, like I said, some of my games are 208 lines long. I think um, um, Ladybug was actually 200 because I needed the uh, vertical space because of you know the, the maze. So I think I took um, four or five lines from overscan and four or five lines from vertical blank or four from each and then added it to the screen itself. So like I said, but there's, there's always a, 
you're taking something, but you're also giving something when you do that. So I lost eight lines of uh, vertical blank and overscan, which I needed to do all my uh, calculations and movements and collision detection. So um, it's, there's always a cost when you make these decisions. The horizontal blank is the 22 cycles I was talking about before. So basically you see on the bottom, you have 76 machine cycles to do something per line. 22 of those are done off screen in your horizontal blank. So you can imagine your beam is going across um, when it's coming back, that 22 cycles is um, time that you have to update registers before you're drawing stuff on the screen again. So that's a good time to set things like PF0 or any images that are to your far left. Because if you do it any later than 22, it's gonna to be too late and you're not gonna see it on your screen. Because everything has to be done as before the beam reaches wherever it is. So if you look at the screen and you see that, um, that skull about four rows down on the far left, you know, if I updated that player graphic at cycle 40, for example, it'd be too late and you wouldn't see it because your beam would already be past it. So you have to update your images before they appear on the screen. So typically what we want to do is just, since your player sprites can be anywhere, typically in a game like this, you need to update them before cycle 22. And same thing for um, um, your play field. Your play field is a little bit more uh, flexible because you know that PF0 is only gonna be shown at the beginning, but PF1 you have till cycle 28. And then six, um, PF2 you have till 36. So you can time those, you can delay those until then. But the, the important things like your players, um, there are things called vertical, um, um, delay registers. That's a little, maybe too much for this, uh, um, discussion, but it's a cool way to be able to update a player sprite, but not have it shown until the next line. Like I said, these guys that uh, designed Atari were pretty, uh, um, um, clever because they knew that they would need something like that. If they were ever going to have two sprites on the screen in a single resolution game being updated because 22 cycles sounds like a lot. But like I said, if you're using seven, eight cycles, just update something, you can only update two things before you're at 16 and then three, you're at 24, you're already too far and you've only updated two, two registers dynamically. Um, and you all also haven't set any colors or anything like that. So you wouldn't have much of a game if that was a limitation. So what they've done, they've allowed, they, um, each player has this delay register that you can set to it, which basically says, um, you can update the player register anywhere on the line, but it won't get updated until you trigger right to the other player register. It's a little complicated and something that probably took me a month to figure out reading it over and over on the Stella list back in the early 2000s, but that was critical to designing good Atari games is learning VDEL and how, and how it works exactly. Basically all it does, it just says, copy your image to a copy I mean, um, take your image and write it to a copy of the register and then switch when you write to the other register. So what you would only have to do, you'd only have to write to one of the registers before cycle 22 and you're just writing to the other one at any time. So it's, it's kind of a cool little trick to, uh, to get around some of these things. So. so there's the program flow that I was talking about. So basically you have your sync signal and then you run game logic during the vertical blank. Um, typically, you know, it says game logic. What I would usually do with the, during the vertical blank is prep the screen for whatever needs to be drawn because that's what's going to happen next is that you're going to be drawing stuff. So that would be like, uh, um, especially if you're doing uh, sprite reuse, um, doing flicker management where you're drawing one image, one frame, and then the other one, the other frame. So you'd have to switch them. Um, maybe you're um, sorting um, images based on which one was drawn last or their vertical position. Um, also setting pointers to what's going to be drawn next um, um, animation um, frames and things like that. Um, colors, whatever. Um, and then um, you actually have your kernel where you redraw the screen. And then you get game logic in the overscan. Usually what I would do in overscan is check things like the joysticks and also... Uh, do collision detection and move my objects and stuff like that. So, um, and then repeat the loop. That's it. So that's uh, that's really how it's uh, how it's done. So, 
Okay, so how are the limited, limited objects used to create complex games? So we'll get into some of the, the meat and potatoes here about how things are done. So, so here's the Space Invaders um, example that I was showing before. So, hey, we only have two player sprites. How wide do I see 36 on there with no, no flicker? Plus I see, um, you know, eight characters for the uh, um, player, uh, for the scores. Um, how is that being done? Well, if we look here, this is um, Stella. Stella is a uh, emulator that um, you can use on your computer to run Atari games. It's also very helpful for developing games as well. Um, we'll get into uh, setting up uh, an development environment. Um, but Stella has an integrated debugger in it. So what you can do while you're running a game, you hit the tilde and it basically brings up the uh, an integrated developer. And one of the cool things you can do is you can um, show uh, TIA colors for the objects that are being drawn on the screen. So you can see on the top here, we see what Space Invaders looks like on the screen. But on the bottom, we see what is actually being used to render those parts of the screen. So you can see that the uh, score is actually being done in purple. And if you look at the purple, that's all done in play field. And based on what color the purple is, it means whether it's PF0, 1, or 2. Um, so that's how they, they were able to do that. Um, and as I mentioned before, you can see what they're doing with the, uh, the uh, invaders themselves. They're basically just using player one and two triplicated. Um, so you can see player one, player zero is red and player one is, uh, is, is yellow. So that's how they do that. So, and so to simulate something getting killed, they just change the uh, duplicate or the triplicate copy of that sprite. So if I hit the one on the, you know, the first guy on the left, basically what they would do is they would just change the exposition of the, uh, um, of player zero to get rid of that far copy. If you hit the one in the middle, they would just change the uh, um, number of copies from three to just two um, far. And that one that would simulate the middle one disappearing. That makes sense? So um, that's how they, they pull that off. Um, we can also see that the uh, the ball is used to draw the missiles. Um, the players are also used to draw the um, the shield and the um, and the actual cannons themselves. And then um, so that's that's kind of how they did things like a space invader. So using uh, things like that. So so this is basically a var variation to this of what are used for almost every single game. So they're always some kind of a combination of player sprites. But as you can see, what you can do is uh, every line, you can change um, what is being drawn for each player sprite. You can also change the X position. So even though you have only have two player sprites, you can see that they got reused um, during that whole section where the um, shields are, and then they get reused again for your cannons. So they were used for the invaders, the shields, and the cannons, all with different X positions. So and what you can see on the far left, all those white stripes, that's, those are called H move bars. And that's basically how you move images on the Atari. Um, you use uh, strobe registers to set course positions. And basically what that means is that it's kind of odd. You would think you'd be able to just say, well, set the exposition of this image to 42. It's not that simple. Basically what you have to do is you have to time um, each, um, each of those objects I've talked about, the uh, player registers and the... Uh, missiles and the ball have a strobe register. So basically what that means is that you have to strobe it, which means you just write to it. And wherever you write to it in the line on that 76 cycles determines what its exposition is gonna be. And, but it's, um, the resolution on that is only um, um, 15 cycles based on how you write to it. So you can only do a course um, setting. Um, it's like, you know, or I shouldn't say that. You can. Uh, it's only three um, three pixel course, because if I write to it at cycle twenty two, it'll be at position zero. But if I write to it uh, at position one, but if I write to it at cycle twenty three, it moves over three pixels, not one or two. So basically, what you need to do is after you do that, you have to do what's called an H move, um, which is a value that you load into another register, and you call you strobe the H move register. And that nudges it over on the next line, either one, two, you can actually go seven pixels one way and eight pixels the other way. So you have 15 pixels of a, um, leeway there. So that's how images are moved horizontally. So 
that in itself is a, probably a master class, just figuring out how to do that. But um, once you do that, um, once you figure that out, then it's uh, it's pretty straightforward. Obviously, drawing, changing the wire position is simple. It's just when you load in that register is when it'll start drawing. So, you know, if you do it right away in your first line, you'll get on the top line. If you wait till the middle, it'll be in the middle. So that's how you move it, you know, from top to bottom. So, so there's just uh, some arrows that are kind of appearing, just showing uh, Daryl must have been saying something um, important at this point. Um, there's a shield, and there's the guy. Okay. Just out of curiosity, on the previous slide, is there a reason why the H move lines are visible in some games and not in others? I mean, I think I remember like um, air sea combat, you do see lines on the left hand side. Of the and air sea valley, yep. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, and then other games you just don't. I mean, was, was that just was that just out of necessity, or was was there just not enough? Cycles left to, to change the colors, or what? I mean, I guess what what creates that situation? I think it's. I, I believe it's been described as a bug in the uh, in the TIA. So oh. that's why the H move bars are there. Oh, um, it may not be a bug. It may be a feature, or it might be because of whatever it's doing at that point. It blanks out the TIA. So, but it, it's pure black, yeah. and that's the problem. So, air sea battle happens to have a blue background. So that's why you see it. A lot of the games like Ladybug um, or um, Space meters, you don't see them because it's a black background. So that's why you don't see it. There is a thing called that they figured out. Um, I'm not sure who figured it out. It was actually done in a, uh, um, a commercial game back in the 80s. It might've been like a magic or someone figured it out. It's called an early H move. Typically what you do is an H move is done the first thing in a line, um, like at cycle zero when you first start a line. So basically you reposition your uh, image on a line using um, the uh, reposition of registers, the strobe registers I was talking about, that'll give you your three pixel course um, setting. And then you load up your H move register and then you call H move on the next line. And then that, that'll shift it over. What they figured out is that if you did the H move at um, cycle 73 um, on the same line, it doesn't have to be on the same line, but just at cycle 73 where it ends at cycle 73, um, it doesn't show the H move line for some reason. But the one caveat is that you can only shift things to the left. So you can shift things to the left zero to 15, but you can't shift anything to the right. Um, so, but that's sometimes that's fine for some people. I actually use uh, an early H move in, um, in uh, Conquest of Mars, which I'll show. Um, and the reason why I do that is that uh, now I have my status screen, which is red, and I didn't want to have the H move line when it was repositioning the player sprites to show the score. So I do an early H move before that. So, and since it's not a sprite, like a game sprite, where sometimes I'd have to move it to the right, I just set the kernel so that I knew it would always have to move to the left. So it wasn't uh, something that uh, affected me. So, um, so yeah, so that's the answer to that. And, some games like Championship Soccer, if you remember Pele Soccer, they explain the H move lines away as calling them the uh, officials, right? Yeah. So, <laughs> well, I mean, that's a good point because I do remember that. It, yeah. Having, having read, we read that manual maybe four or five months ago. And yeah. You're exactly right. It was called out. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, and a lot of times it's just used as part of the game. So, um, and what some people do, and Activision started doing this as well, is that they would just do an H move on every single line. So basically what it appears, and what it does, it covers up the eight far pixels on the, on the left. But so if you do it every single, they actually use it to their advantage. What they do is they call H move on every single line. And so that creates a solid black bar on the left. And they actually use that to uh, mask um, sprites as they come onto the screen. So instead of having this like jerky appear on the screen, they're hidden by eight pixels of a H move. So they actually used it to their advantage. So if you ever notice, go check out some of the games sometimes, you'll see that they're off kilter just by a little bit. And it's because the left side of their screen is all black. You just don't notice it because it doesn't jump out at you. Yeah. But they do use it for like barnstorming and stuff like that where yeah. you yeah, see I'm things. This, I think I'll, I'll look, I'll look at it. Yeah, you'll be able to check it out. And again, just run it in Stella and hit the um, 
hit the tilde and you'll see that they'll show up as white in your um if you turn on debug colors and you'll see okay well that's how they did it so so it's kind of neat so so there's um ladybug we talked about this we won't go over it too much but you can see that the uh um, special and extra are 48 pixel sprites. Um, and then what I did here is I uh, used um, player um, one to draw all of my skulls and my uh, um, letters and hearts and things like that. And then player zero, I used to multiplex things like the uh, insects and the, uh, the ladybug itself. Um, so, and if you're smart enough and you keep things in their own bands, you can reduce flicker because as long as you don't have more than two independent uh, sprites in the same vertical or horizontal area, you don't have to flicker them. But um, once you do, that's where um, intelligent flickering comes into play, where you say, okay, I'm gonna draw this one in this frame, and this one in the other frame. Um, some games like Pac-Man didn't use intelligent flicker at all, and that was because I think uh, Todd Fry, I mentioned ESA, didn't wanted to use 8K. They told him he could only use four, so he didn't have enough space to write an intelligent flicker routine. So basically, you're um, he draws um, every um, ghost on every single screen on, on, on every single frame, but doesn't redo sprite reuse. So he basically has to use 15 hertz flicker on the good the, the ghost every single time. So it looks terrible because 15 is pretty bad. Um, so there's Conquest of Mars. I'm just a uh, Again, we'll show you here. So this one you can see. Um, so you can see it doesn't actually show the H move bar here because um, it's an early H move. So if you look where the score is in the bottom, where it says zero, zero, um, the line before that, I'm actually using an early H move and it's uh, um, and it, it doesn't show up. So um, you can also see some unique things here, like where I have the uh, um, stage display, you know, I'm using, uh, the player graphics to show the border of the stages. Um, but then I'm using the play field itself to color. And I actually do use a, a mid um, color change of the play field. So when you get to the, the base, it actually blinks. So um, when it's showing the uh, the stage for that. So um, so basically that's just uh, the whole stage displays a bunch of 48 pixel sprites being reused. Um, and then you can see how the play field is being used here. It's a, Again, I use a reflected play field, even though it's not a reflected image. Um, so the timing's a little bit more um, tight. Basically, if you use uh, an asymmetrical play field with a reflected image, you have to update your right side of the play field too at cycle 48 exactly, or you're gonna have some, uh, it's gonna show the wrong graphics. That's the one restriction. Um, but people, when I first released this, they said, hey, how did you, uh, reposition those uh, three uh, enemies on the top there without any H move lines. And the answer was simply, I just didn't use any H move lines. I decided the locations of the uh, images to be coarse enough where I didn't have to shift them at all. So they're at three pixel intervals, um, those three. So I don't have to use any H move lines. So um, sometimes the easiest answer is just not to do it. <laughs> so. Um, let me jump into Scramble real quick. So Scramble is uh, similar. Again, um, the reason why I used, um, you would think that maybe it would be easier to use an asymmetrical um, non-reflected play field here. Um, so I wouldn't have to be updating play field two. Do you understand when I say um, reflected? That means play field two stops in the middle and then it starts again immediately because it's reflected, play field two. So basically you have to update your right side at exactly cycle 48, or it's gonna contain the uh, um, data from the left side. So that's a restriction that I put in there. But the reason why I do that is because um, to even get Scramble to fit with all the multi um, color graphics, stuff like that, and the changes in the colors for the uh, play field, I, can, I couldn't afford to, uh, write to all six um, 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 play field images. So if I wasn't using reflected, I would have PF1, PF2, PF0, PF1, and then a half of PF2 to get the same um, 32 um, pixels of resolution. 
but by reflecting it, I only have PF one, two, two, and one. So I've saved myself five cycles um, at the cost of having that specific timing for updating PF two. Maybe too specific, but I've done that in almost all my games, like Mappy, for example. Um, and I find that it's better to have that restriction than the alternative, which is having to give up five cycles. Because if I did that, then one of my images couldn't be multicolor or I couldn't have a specific um, update to uh, uh, another register that makes the game look better, in my opinion. So, But it does cause some issues with repositioning. Um, since that has to happen on that, on that cycle, you can never reposition on that, that line because of the delay um, it takes to write to the, your reposition register. It's going to be more than 15 um, pixels away. Um, it's a little specific, but what happens is that it makes it impossible to reposition a uh, image at that, um, at that specific exposition. Um, but there's ways to get around it. And what I would do is I would just not reposition. I would reposition if the value of uh, PF2 was the same on both sides and just write to the uh, um, register one cycle later or before. Um, again, that's getting probably a little too specific, but some things that I worked around to uh, so I could still have the best of both worlds. So Super Cobra is basically exactly the same engine, so we don't spend too much time on this, but you can see this one, for some reason, I'm doing an HMOON on every line, and it might have been because I was using something, something every line, I remember. Maybe I was, I don't know, that's funny. Well, it was five or six years ago, but for some reason you can see I'm actually using um, HMOVE on every single line in, um, in uh, Super Cobra, and it must be something I'm drawing that requires that I shift things over every single line. So, um, but you don't see it, as I said, it's all black anyway. So, and I'm not using the far left of the screen anyway. So, um, you never get to see it. So, um, and here's Mappy. So Mappy is unique in that, um, again, it's using um, PF1 and 2 reflected. Um, so I only have four um, rights. Um, I do all my um, repositioning during the platform levels, um, as you can see where the H moves are. So there's no um, repositioning of uh, images before that because when the doors are open or closed and depending on the colors and stuff like that, um, I have the kernels where the prizes are and the doors are much more complicated. You can even see that I'm using the, um, the ball for the door handles. Um, if you can see see that, so that whole those bands of area are too complicated to uh, do any repositions on, because I do multiple color changes to the uh, play field to uh, simulate the flashing doors or the blue doors after they get open and stuff like that. So um, to get around that, I do all my repositions on the platform levels, and there's actually one of the levels of the platform level where. Um, I draw all the trampolines, and the trampolines are drawn using the uh, background color. So, and the background color could be changed multiple times per line as well. So those are, Mappy was a special case, because also this whole screen scrolls. So these, there's multiple kernels that say, okay, well, if there's a trampoline and then a blank, then another trampoline, and they're different colors, I need to use this kernel. If there's, you know, a, um, no blank here, then a blank here, then a trampoline, I gotta use this kernel. Um, so I had to use um, a lot of logic in that um, to, to get to set that up. So, but just to give you guys some ideas that when I say there's a kernel and stuff like that, um, you know, you don't, you aren't tied to just one kernel for an entire game. You know, if you need background color changes on just one line of your kernel and that's all you need it for, then that's that. Um, and then you can have specific kernels for repositioning and specific ones just for play field changes and play field color changes and stuff like that. So Mappy was a fairly complicated game and that, that was uh, one of the uh, one of the big things that... Uh, um, I, I appreciate you clarifying that because every time that I've heard David Crane talk about development, he always talks about the kernel as just a collective, I guess a collective unit that drives the entire game. Mm -hmm. So I've always, understood it or I guess assumed it to be 
like one discrete unit of logic per game. Yeah, I think probably back then it was. Um, but certainly what I've done and, and certainly with the arm is that um, you have the flexibility to draw kernel lines. What I, what I do is I, I'll draw a kernel that's 76 cycles exactly. And you use this thing called fast jump. Um, we'll get into that later. But basically it's a, a jump at the end of your kernel, the last three cycles that you can set dynamically to jump to another kernel anytime, even the same kernel. So if you want to do like a, like the score kernel would be the same kernel eight times because it's doing the same thing. It's loading data and triplicating its um, data. Um, and so that would be called eight times. And then it would jump out and say, now I'm going to draw the, the roof. So I'm using the roof kernel. And then it gets to the point where it's going to draw, you know, the, um, the doors. So that's a, another 20 lines of a different kernel. And then um, that specific trampoline kernel I was talking about, you know, so basically I would stitch together a list of all the kernels that need to be called in their order. So it really gives you flexibility, so. Anyway, so yeah, if they get to wrap this up, I guess I, I'm gonna have to, I guess I should have made another, uh, maybe I can talk to David about having another uh, session before the end of the weekend. So, because yeah, I still got, we need to get into the arm. This is a, yeah. No, maybe we do one tomorrow morning. Yeah, yeah I'll talk to him. There's, I don't think there's a session tomorrow morning until like 11.30. Yeah. So maybe, maybe he could give us another hour or some whatever morning. Yeah, I think an hour might be good, so. Okay, so maybe we'll just wrap. Sorry, guys. You know, it's like a. Oh, no. Yeah, I was actually trying to keep this as simple as possible, yeah. but, but um, um, as you can see, there's there's a lot lot going on. But we did talk about the arm at least a little bit. Like a lot of the stuff I'm talking about is, uh, you know, um, the arm makes it a lot easier. That's what I really wanted to get into is like how the arm helps. So that way, yeah. kind of removes that. Oh, it's just this huge, powerful thing that makes you can do anything now. It's like it's not how it works. It's really, um, it is very powerful, but it's, you know, it's limiting in what, how it helps you. Like I said, it can only use a vertical blank and an overscan, and it's uh, really doing all, yes. Are you using it then to do like a lot of your case selection logic and everything like that? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. 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 Since, you know, the arm's running at 70 megahertz, even though you're only running it for a few lines of overscan or vertical blank, it's still a lot more time than you'll get in a, uh, in the, uh, the Atari, right, at one megahertz. So that's where all the case logic. So when I say like these, you know, specific kernels, when I'm saying like, oh, you know, if I have two trampolines in a space and a yes, door, exactly. use this kernel, that logic's written in C, yeah. and then it just populates a list to say, okay, for my 200 lines, I need kernel, you know, I need my 48 pixel kernel for lines zero to 10. I need this trampoline kernel here. I need this one to draw, to reposition my player, you know, and then, it just goes through and using that jump, uh, fast jump, it basically jumps through your code in, in the, the actual Atari. Yeah, and that, that code has to be run at one megahertz. So, but all the prep you can do before that. So basically what you're doing, you're just making it so the Atari has little work as to do as possible, but it still has to do all the major work and communication with the TIA, which is the sound, reading the switches, the joysticks, and rendering all the graphics, you know, that all still has to be done by the Atari. So, okay, I guess we're gonna have to wrap this up, guys. So, uh, but I appreciate the, uh, the attention and uh, hopefully, uh, even though it's a kind of a microcosm of what I wanted to, to say, it's uh, hopefully it's enough to whet your appetite. And, uh, oh, yeah. and again, there's tons of resources, so. Um, Definitely want to hear what you have to say about setting up the development environment as well, because I'd love to understand how that looks today versus how it even looked 10 years ago or, or even how it looked back in 1982. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure. I know in 82 it was more like uh, punch cards and stuff like that. Um, they, maybe they had some dev environments, stuff like that. Just so you know, um, what I use simply is I just use TextPad um, and it has like a 6502 symbol um, library that you can load that highlights all your uh, keywords. Um, then you're including include files that you can get from anywhere that define all the um, TIA Atari registers. So that's basically all you're doing is you're writing it. And then I configured a couple of tools to call the, the assembler. Um, I also need um, to fire off the C compiler for assembly for the ARM. Um, and it combines those into a, a, um, a binary. 
Then I have another tool. When I say a tool, it's just like, you know, all one or all two, whatever you want to configure to actually fire off Stella. So um, that's really all we're doing from a development environment, but it'd be nice to be able to show you exactly yeah, how to do that. So, nice to yeah, so, okay. So we'll, we'll wrap this up guys and uh, thanks for your attention and uh, hopefully you guys enjoyed it, okay? Okay, thanks. Thank you.